Hi there, and welcome again to the Employment Law Show. Good to have you along for the half hour. Please stick around. I can guarantee you one thing, you're going to learn a lot for sure about your workplace rights. John Scholes here, Lior Samfiru as well from employmentlawyer.ca. Want to reach out to Lior anytime. Phone number is always good, 1-855-821-5900, help at employmentlawyer.ca. And if you've got some time and you're on your tablet or your smartphone, you can go to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. That particular website is bountiful. It'll show you all kinds of things as it pertains to your workplace rights. You'll have free and anonymous access as well to the severance pay calculator. does what it's told and has for over 2 million Canadians. Millions across the country have, uh, as we like to call it, take it out for a spin and see what that real severance offer should be. You can use that any time. And, of course, we'll make reference to it throughout the, uh, the half hour of that. And our main topic, Guide to Workplace Accommodations. What is that? all about we'll get to that in just a bit but Lior pal we always start off with the week that was a case of the day what's going on with you hey John great to be here of Come course on. always want to talk about employment law and try to educate our good viewers about this very very important topic not everyone knows their rights but by watching the show you will know your rights you'll know what to do if you're facing a workplace problems if your boss is not doing what your boss is supposed to if you're not being treated properly or if your entitlements are being compromised maybe you lost your job a lot of people have been calling my office uh, losing their jobs recently and guess what almost all of them have not been offered proper compensation proper severance it's very common it's it's almost unusual it's very unusual in fact when I see someone with a proper severance package so if you lost your job chances are you're at a lot more than what you've been offered and we'll talk why that is and what to do and how that works uh, and make sure you understand your legal rights if your a job has been impacted but of course I'm here on TV uh, once or so a week but I'm in the office every day. If you want to talk to me privately, if you want to have that private chat to understand your rights and help me enforce them, just call or email. We'll give you that contact information, of course, throughout the show. But now that we know what we want to do, let me tell you uh, how we're going to do it. Let me tell you about a situation that came across my desk very recently, John. I spoke with a gentleman that decided uh, that he wanted to go overseas to spend some time with his family. There were some family issues there, uh, and he wanted to go spend about six or, uh, weeks or so with his family. So he asked his employer, I said, can I take a, a leave for six weeks? You don't have to pay me. I just want to take a leave. Mm -hmm. Initially, the company said, no, we can't do that. We need you here. Eventually, said fine we'll let you take that leave and come back in six weeks and everything will be fine so fine fast forward six weeks later he's there comes back comes back to work except employer says no no you were gone for too long we, we don't have a job for you now so you're off work we'll let you know if anything changes down the road he's of course very upset because he believed that he had a job that's why he went on this trip uh, and he calls me of course so here's the thing Remember, a company can let someone go at any time and for any reason. But in this case, even though he was gone for six weeks, he's owed his full severance. Now, keep in mind, the company did not have to agree to allow him to take six weeks. But they did. They told him, yeah, you're fine. So at that point, his absence was authorized. So now when he comes back, if they've changed their mind that they don't have a job, Fine, they can let him go, we know that, but they have to pay him severance. They can't say, well, you were gone for too long, therefore you're not getting severance. But the reason I'm mentioning this, because this is a fairly common situation where a company does something or gives something to an employee that they're not required to do, but then they change their mind. Well, if the company gives you something, that becomes a term of employment. And the company can't just change that uh, or take that away. That could be a constructive dismissal. That could be a wrongful dismissal. So if your company gives you extra vacation or if a company gives you a, a bonus payment or a raise and then they kind of want to take it back, they can't necessarily do that. You have rights, and once something is done, that becomes a term of employment. So for this guy, he had worked for the company for over nine and a half years. He could be looking at as much as 12, uh, 12 months of severance. I'm going to help him get that. So if you're in a situation where your company changed its mind, they're not living up to an agreement, let's have that discussion. Did he get, not that it matters in this case, because obviously it turned out okay for this, uh, this client, but did he get it in writing? Was it verbal? And you should always get it in writing, even for a little six-week... Absolutely. Imagine if he didn't get it in writing and he went off for six weeks. Company says, we never allowed you. You just took off. Really? So you resigned. Yeah. No. Bad situation to be in. Luckily, there was an email chain there confirming, yes, that's fine. We expect you back to work on this date. So it's fine. 
always, always, if a company gives you a promise, makes you a promise, you have an agreement with them, an email, a text message, something in writing, so you can enforce it later. What is it, if you extend that a little further, Lior, to say holidays, you say you've booked a plan and you know, your employer initially says, yeah, you're good to go, whatever, second week in July, you're gone for two weeks, great, and then they pull it back before you go and say, you know what, we can't actually, we can't let you go, so you, you can't have that now. So it's a good point that a company generally has the right to schedule vacation. Some people are surprised by that, but an employer can say, I've decided you're taking your vacation from uh, this date to that date. But if the company has approved your vacation and you've relied on that approval, you've made your p travel plans, you've bought your tickets, whatever it is, they can't just take their, that, that back. They can't change their mind because you relied on that approval. If you ask for a vacation, they approve it, and the next day they take it back before you've done anything, yeah, they can do that. But if you've gone a, a ways to make commitments, to plan that vacation, to spend money, to, to make arrangements, your company can't just change their mind with respect to that vacation. So it doesn't even matter how long you've been there. They can't actually schedule your, your holidays. Most, most viewers would not know that. I mean, hey, you're getting February every year. Yeah. Enjoy. <laughs> well, employers don't do that because it's going to cause employees to be very unhappy. You're going to have a lot of unhappy employees. So employers usually tell the employees, you tell us when you want to take vacation and we'll try to approve it. But an employer can say, I've decided you're taking vacation on these days and that's it, full stop. Yeah, th that's actually legal. You guys can reach out anytime, by the way, as you know, 1-855-821-5900. We also do a ton of radio across the country. have been doing that for probably 13 years or so. It's been a while. We always encourage you to listen up to a station near you and call in, get on air, ask your questions. We like to throw the phone calls uh, on this show as well and talk about them. Your first phone call for the day is coming right up. Walked into work yesterday, seven years on the job, was told that the company was going in a different direction and laid off, offering me seven weeks in lieu of um, not giving me notice and an additional seven for the seven years I was there and $3,500 to sign the release. Okay, and what kind of a job and how old are you? 33 years old, assistant manager at a retail store. There you go. So this individual may well feel, and I would understand, that it's unfair, maybe it's unjust, you know, I'm, I've done a good job, why should I be let go? And, and that's legitimate, and I probably feel the exact same way in that situation. But ultimately, from a legal standpoint, the question here becomes severance. He was offered seven weeks termination pay, another seven weeks for a total of 14 weeks. The question is, is that legitimate? Is that enough? Because whether we like it or not, whether we agree with it or not, the company can let him go as long as that severance is paid. So let's find out if the 14 weeks that he was offered after about seven or so years with his employer as a retail manager, let's find out if that's enough. And I'm going to go back to use our tool that John mentioned at the beginning of the show, our severance calculator. You can find that at pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. We're going to use that right now and let's see what that actually gives us. So we know that this person is a retail manager, assistant manager, been there for seven years, 33 years of age. We see that the company has offered him 14 weeks total. Well, except what? We see that he's owed six to eight months. So he was offered right around half, maybe even less than half of what he's owed. Six to eight months is what he's owed, was offered 14 weeks. So that is a wrongful dismissal, John. It's not a wrongful dismissal because the company had a bad reason to let him go. It's a wrongful dismissal because he's owed a lot more than what he was offered. And it, it doesn't appear, based on those numbers, that this, this employer probably had any malice towards him. They did, oh, it's two weeks per year, seven weeks, 14 weeks. Have a nice day. A lot of employers believe that. Certainly a lot of employees believe that. Well, that's legitimate, two weeks per year. No, not even close. Remember, the factors are your age, your position, and the length of your employment. And for this person, that's six to eight months of severance. Phone call number two. Let's get into that one, Lior, and uh, hash it apart. I've been with my current employer for five years. Last year, they made me a promise if I set up brand new software and I would get a $10,000 bonus. If I do my tax course that they gave me and I do taxes, they'd give me another $10,000 increase. So I ended up doing that after like late last year after fighting them trying to get the money. They said to me, no, they will not be giving me those increases. So good timing. I was talking about it at the beginning of the show that if a company does something they're not required to do, but they do it anyway, they can't just take it back. Now, in this situation, John, that employer did not have to agree to pay a bonus, but they did. They said, if you do this employee, we're going to pay you a bonus. So if the employee did what was required and they can show that there was that agreement, there's an email, there's some, something in writing confirming that bonus terms, that employer now has to live up to that agreement. 
So that means if this employer won't pay, number one, there could be legal action against that employer for unpaid bonus, unpaid wages. That could even result potentially in a constructive dismissal. And this is all in a situation where the company never had to agree to do it to begin with, but they did. If you're in that situation, if your company made you a promise and now they're not living up to it, yeah, there could be absolutely recourse here. We'll get into a short break here and come back with our third phone call plus the guide to workplace accommodation. That is on the way, so stick around. In the meantime, the phone number, anytime you know how to reach them, 1-855-821-5900. Help at employmentlawyer.ca. Lots more of the Employment Law Show coming up. Stick around. People think you have to sign back a severance offer by a deadline. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Deadlines are used as a pressure tactic. Make sure the offer is fair before you sign. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. Can insurance companies deny long-term disability claims for mental illness? When you're suffering from a mental health disability, insurance companies just don't understand. But we do. They can absolutely not force you back to work. If your doctors say you are not ready and you know you're not ready, they cannot make you go back to work. If you have a mental health disability and your claim is denied, don't give up. Give us a call and let us fight for you. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back, and get what you're owed. People think you aren't owed severance pay if you are fired for a reason. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Most for-cause terminations are false and you are still owed full severance. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. All right, welcome back, Employment Law Show. Thank you so much for sticking around. Again, John Scholes, Lior Samfiru. Reach out to Lior and his team anytime. You can do so. Phone calls, great. 1-855-821-5900. The email is help at employmentlawyer.ca. And that website, it's free. It's anonymous. You'll learn tons. You'll have access to the uh, severance calculator, which we just demonstrated a short time ago. Pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. And employmentlawyer.ca to find a radio show you can tune into and join us on air throughout the country as well, pretty much from coast to coast. We're getting there. We're almost there. But uh, we play the phone calls on this show. Playing back, Leora's promised her uh, phone call number three coming up right now. I just turned 65. I got laid off during COVID, got called back. But I just had my yearly review from last year. And after I read it, I, I, I really felt bad. I couldn't believe it. And I went to my boss, went to him and said, can you be specific? What are the incidents on record? Well, he couldn't give me an answer. And he said, nobody reads these things. How do I protect myself? Nobody reads these things. Don't worry yeah, about don't it. Worry it's about fine. It. It's a flesh wound. No, it, it, it's, it's right. silly. An employer's not going to do something, bother with a document to have you sign it, but it's nothing. It, it makes no sense, and it's, it is an important document. So when it comes to performance reviews, negative performance reviews, or a performance improvement plan, they could be used against you if the company wants to let you go. So if you have a couple of those, the company may say, well, we, we gave you a negative review, we gave you another one, you're not getting it, so we're going to let you go. And if you're silent, if you say nothing about it, it's the same as you're accepting it. And then it's going to make it much more difficult to fight that termination for cause. So what do you do in this situation? What do you do if your employer gives you a negative performance review that you don't agree with? Well, we've talked about it before, but it's still important to remind you is you respond to it. You're not silent. You don't ignore it. You don't believe your employer when they tell you it's nothing you respond to it in writing. And what I mean by that, John, you send an email, a text message is fine, saying, here's why I don't agree with it. Here's what you haven't considered. Here's some of the facts that you need to know. And that's all you need to do. You don't need the company to respond to it. You don't need the company to sign it. Just respond to it. By responding to it, you're going to make it very difficult for the company to rely on it later because you haven't accepted it. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to make it as difficult as possible for the company to let you go for cause. So if something negative is said about you, uh, a bad performance, if it's legitimate, it's legitimate. If it's not, or it's not accurate, or it's not complete, say so and preserve your rights. You know, you mentioned the performance improvement plan in, in that same breath. Is that a tool that your employer might use to try to edge you close to the door if need be, if they're trying to do that anyway? Always, absolutely. A performance improvement plan is always a step that the company takes towards a termination and usually a termination for cause. The company wants to say, we've tried to, to help you, to tell you what's wrong and, and you still are not doing it. What more can we do? Now, if it's not accurate, if they're putting on a performance improvement plan for reasons you don't agree with, you have to say so. Again, silence is a bad idea. 
If you are silent, you may as well be saying, yes, you're right, and I'm wrong. If you don't think you're wrong, if you don't think your employer is right, you have to respond to it. Don't be aggressive, by the way. I don't want anyone to say, how dare you? This is ridiculous. You're a bad employer. No. Professionally, respectfully, but tell them exactly why you don't agree. Main topic, as uh, mentioned earlier, guide to workplace accommodation. Let's get into that right away, Leo. Number one, employees must be accommodated by their employers if they have a medical condition. Goes back to your doctor, yeah? And, and the, the key word that you use there is must, yep. okay? The duty to accommodate is an obligation that an employer has to provide help, support, and changes even to the workplace if there's a, required, uh, if there's a requirement to do so. Uh, it doesn't just apply in a medical condition, but we're talking specifically now in a medical situation where you have a medical limitation. And the key is to understand is it's not for your employer to say, yes, we will, no, we won't, or we do want to, or we don't want to. Your, uh, your employer doesn't get a say. The law comes in and says you have to accommodate if there's that need. We'll talk about how that duty is triggered. Mm -hmm. But the key that I want everyone to remember is it's not up to the employer. So many times I get a call from an individual saying my employer decided they don't want to accommodate me. But they don't get to make that decision. No one's asked the employer to tell us what you think. If the employer is actually able to accommodate, they have to accommodate, and if they don't, that's illegal, that could be a human rights violation. Now, some of the obligation falls on the employee for number two, where it says an employee must provide their employer with a note from their doctor detailing the restrictions. Right? So that's how you trigger that duty to accommodate. Right. You trigger it by getting a doctor's note saying, here's what the limitations are. Maybe you need modified duties, modified hours, maybe you need a different desk, or you need a position with responsibilities that are less physically demanding. Maybe you need to work from home. Not for me to say, not for the individual to say, it's up to the doctor. But once you have that doctor's note, that employer now has that obligation. They can't ignore it. They can't say, we don't want to. They can't say, we don't believe your doctor. They have to provide that accommodation. Again, not doing so illegal, but go to your doctor, get that doctor's note. That's what triggers that obligation. We're talking about your guide to workplace accommodation. Point number uh, three is this, Lior. Employers do not have to provide accommodation for employees expressing preferences rather than medical conditions. So oftentimes I do get uh, calls from individuals saying, I told my employer what the accommodation that I want and they're not doing it. Well, did you give them a doctor's note? No, no, I just told them what I needed or what I wanted. Speed bag what, chair, that's what I want. I, wouldn't that be nice? And, and in many cases, it's a legitimate accommodation, but it's not up to you, the individual, to say. Just like your employer can't say, you should have this or you shouldn't have this, you can't say that the same thing. So it comes down to your doctor. So it doesn't matter what you believe, uh, if your employer uh, needs to, or you want your employer to accommodate, get that doctor's note. At that point, that the guest of work is done, your employer doesn't have the ability to say no, so go to the doctor, get that doctor's note, and by the way, your doctor's probably done this before, they know what to say, they know what to do, so don't be shy to talk to your doctor. Number four is this, uh, Lior, employers must provide accommodation up to the point of undue hardship. We've heard that, uh, we've heard that phrase several times, countless times on the show. What does it mean? Break it down. Well, I often get asked, okay, we understand the company has to accommodate, but what what, how far do they have to go? Where's the limits? Are there limits to that accommodation? You know, what if the accommodation is that the company has to switch to a different building? Is that reasonable? Well, no. So the duty to accommodate is what we call accommodation to the point of undue hardship. That means that even if it's difficult, the company still has to do it. Now, at some point, it becomes too difficult or too costly or too complicated that they don't have to go that far. The thing that I've seen time and time again for the last 20 plus years is employers saying that it's too difficult when it's not, when it's, they haven't reached that point of undue hardship. It really is a situation where the company can show that it's just not possible really to do it. So if the company doesn't try hard enough, that's illegal. Even if it's cost them money, even if it creates some problems for the company, they still have to accommodate. And does the goalpost move? Is the threshold higher for a company that's a multinational, thousands of employees with, with money versus, you know, mom and dad's pizza shop in the corner, right? It's going to be very difficult for the huge company to say, oh my gosh, that's just impossible. There's nothing at all for you. Very tough to do that. So that means if they don't accommodate, that's probably a human rights violation. On the other hand, as you say, the, the tiny little store with one or two employees may just not have the the ability the positions the resources to provide that accommodation so it may be easier for that employer to say we don't have to accommodate they still have to try their best so depending on the company the duty to accommodate or the threshold of accommodation may be different but it's still very important that an employer do everything it can 
to accommodate. And you kind of touched on our final point uh, briefly there, Leo. Number five is this. A refusal to accommodate can be considered a human rights violation. Yes, it's a big deal. Human rights laws are some of the most important laws that we have anywhere. And one of the most important human rights laws that we have is the one that says that if you don't accommodate, you've breached human rights laws. You've done something wrong. So that's a human rights violation can entitle the employee to damages, significant damages. By the way, the failure to accommodate itself can also be a constructive dismissal. So it is a, a, a very big deal for a company to refuse to accommodate or not to go far enough to accommodate. If you find yourself in that situation, you've given that doctor's note, your employer's not doing it, they're saying, no, just go off on a disability leave and come back later. That's not legal. You give me a call. Lots uh, to digest there. If you want more uh, following in the show, you can always reach out to Lior as we get into a short break here. Make that phone call, right? 1-855-821-5900. Help at employmentlawyer.ca. And stay with us on the other side. We're coming back with more of the Employment Law Show. People think you should go to the government to get severance pay. Employmentlawyer.ca says that is a myth. Government can only help you get minimum severance, but not everything you're entitled to. Always check with The Employment Lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. If your long-term disability claim is denied, should you appeal? Appeals often fail because insurance companies control the process. So long as you appeal, you're playing by their rules. You should never appeal the denial of your disability benefits. Appeals are just a mirage of false hope. Don't. That's their process. Take it out of their hands and fight for your rights with our help. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back, and get what you're owed. People think their employer can make changes to their job. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Your employer can't change your pay, hours, or duties. You may be entitled to full severance pay. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. Welcome back, Employment Live Show. Good to have you along. John Scholes, Lior Samfiru, each week to reach out to Lior and the team afterwards. 1 855 821 5900. Help at employmentlawyer.ca and that website, pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. There's also a website called terminationquestions.com. Again, terminationquestions.com. Free, anonymous, and another place for you to ask questions, whether you're on your uh, office computer, your desktop, your tablet, or your cell phone, use it, give it a shot, and uh, send us some questions. For this week, Lior, here we go. Management has recently called all employees back to the office three days per week with only a couple weeks' notice. They've threatened termination with cause for anyone who does not agree to this, regardless of personal circumstances. Can they fire someone with cause for this? That's a very interesting question, and if we had talked about this maybe six months ago, I may have given you a different answer than yep. what I'm about to say. So, so let's break this down a bit. So during COVID, during the pandemic, a lot of employers uh, decided to have employees work remotely. Of course, it was the responsible thing to do, but oftentimes an employee didn't have to do that, but they did. That's okay. But because it was a unique situation, this the pandemic, an employer was able to say, okay, now that we're past the pandemic, we can have you come back to work in the office because that was a, a, a COVID thing. Yeah. And in that situation, if an employee decided, well, I don't want to come back to work, that could be a, a resignation or even grounds for a termination for cause. But not so fast. We're now in 2024. Uh, the pandemic has been behind us for the most part for a while now. That means that an employer could have had you come back to work a long time ago uh, once the pandemic was really behind us, but they chose not to. They said, no, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to let you work from, uh, remotely. But now, you know what? A year later, a year and a half later, now we're going to actually have you come back. Well, wait a second. You, you could have asked me to do something you didn't. So it became a term of employment. Now I'm a remote employee. So your employer cannot necessarily require you to come back to work. So this is, goes back to what I said at the beginning of the show. Company didn't have to let you work from home all this time, but they did. Once they did, it becomes a term of employment. That means if the company wants to let you go now for not coming into the office, that may be a without cause termination, meaning you are owed severance. If you're in a situation where the company wants to push, uh, push on you to go back to work, they want, they're pushing and putting that pressure on you, before you say yes or no, let's talk about it. I want to do this correctly because you may still be owed your full severance. Weekly, you can join Lior and his other lawyers on the uh, live stream on Facebook and YouTube. Ask your questions at ST Lawyers is how you join that. Here we go, Lior. My boss yells at me regularly and puts me in front of, puts me down in front of colleagues. I've talked to HR several times about this, and they keep saying that they will speak to him. So far, nothing's changed. 
Due to the added stress, my doctor is telling me to take some time off work. What can I do here? So this person's done the right thing. They've talked to their employer, talked to HR about going back uh, or the employer dealing with this individual because it's the company's legal obligation to deal with this individual. They can't ignore it. So here's what I would want uh, this person to do. Make sure that it's in writing, that you contacted HR in writing. You don't want HR to say you never told us because it was all verbal and there's no proof. So send another email saying, I've talked to you a few times about this, this manager that's treating me badly. You haven't done anything. I'm asking, it's impacting my health now. Please deal with this. And if the company then deals with it and fixes the problem, maybe removes this manager or, or talks to them so that he knows he can't do that, fantastic, problem solved. If it continues, if your employer still doesn't do anything about it, well, wait a second. That could be a constructive dismissal by your employer creating that toxic work environment and then not fixing it when they should have. That's a constructive dismissal. That could also potentially be a human rights violation. That could be a breach of occupational health and safety legislation. It's illegal. But I want you to put that in writing. If the issue doesn't get fixed, you give me a call right away. Just like accommodation, all goes back to your doctor. All goes back to the doctor. The doctor's always so important. Uh, it's your ace in the hole, literally, so use it. It is time for Employment Law Show Rapid Fire. Let's get into that. Okay, rapid fire. Lior in the hot seat. Always for this segment of the show, let's get into it. Number one, can my employer, Lior, let me go for cause due to performance issues? The answer is almost always going to be no. It's extremely difficult to terminate employment for cause. And if it's a performance issue, unless it's so bad that you're essentially deliberately doing a bad job, the answer is going to be no. You cannot be fired for cause for performance issues in most cases. Three strike rule, kind of, right? Three strike rule or, or that performance is so bad, like I said, you're deliberately you're, you're sabotaging the company. In most cases, that's not the case. So that would be a without cause termination, meaning severance is owed. Number two, is my employer allowed to demote me even if they leave my salary intact? In most cases, the answer is no, because a demotion could be embarrassing. It's going to change your stature and your status in the workplace, even if the salary is the same. So if you're now in a position where because of this demotion, it's embarrassing, people look at you differently, that could be a constructive dismissal. A lot of employers thinks, think it's not a constructive dismissal if the salary is the same. No, not at all. If you've been demoted, chances are it's a constructive dismissal regardless of the salary. Can you take it out for a spin? Try it. I wouldn't do that. When it comes to a demotion, unless it's something you're not sure about, I would say either you accept it or you treat it as a constructive dismissal. You have a short time to do that, so you want to give me a call. Rapid fire question number three for this week. Your employer can't classify you as a contractor if you work exclusively for them, yeah? That is correct. Usually a contractor by definition is someone that has multiple clients or customers that they work for. So uh, if I'm a, a plumber, I'm not just going to be working exclusively in one home long term. I'm going to have several uh, customers, sev several clients because I'm not an employee of anyone. I'm an independent contractor. Well, if I work exclusively for a company, that probably means I'm an employee in the eyes of the law, regardless of what the company calls me. So if they call me an independent contractor, Contractor, guess what? That's a misclassification. Rapid fire, here we go. Next question. Can my employer let me go right before a bonus payment? Nice. Well, they can let you go, but they're going right. to have to pay severance and potentially the bonus payment as well. They can avoid paying a bonus by conveniently choosing a date that uh, somehow deprives you of that bonus. Especially if there's history involved, right? Absolutely. If you usually get a bonus, they have to pay the bonus. And if the company, by the way, tries desperately to avoid paying that, not only will they have to pay it, they may actually have to pay additional bad faith damages for engaging in that type of a conduct. All right, final rapid fire question for this week. Can my employer force me to sign a termination release immediately right now? They may try, but the answer is no, 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 they cannot. Your legal rights do not expire for two whole years. I want you to remember that when it comes to your severance. So that deadline is meaningless. It's a pressure tactic. It's there to make you feel like you're going to lose something. Don't fall for it, okay? Regardless of what it says, Take your time, go to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca to use the severance calculator or give me a call. Do the right thing. Take a breath, relax, call Lior, that's all you got to do. We are done for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Any questions you have for a future show, you can email. How about that? That's help at employmentlawyer.ca. Use that website, pocketemploymentlawyer.ca, absolutely free. And then finally, the phone number anytime, 1-855-821-5900. Thank you so much. We'll catch you next time right here on the Employment Law Show.